All right, so we know what rational tangles are at this point, and we've had an introduction to the basic operations of tangles, namely the twist, T, and the rotation, R. Uh, and we have now a sense of how twists and rotations interact one with another. So we're beginning to build the operations in what we call the tangle group. So, so far we know three things. We know that twists and rotations do not commute one with another. It matters if I twist first and then rotate, or vice versa. Second, we know that the twist is an operation that has infinite order. We can keep twisting as many times as we want to in succession, and we never get something which is the same as what we started with originally. Whereas rotations, once I do a rotation twice, I'm back to the same tangle, equivalent isotopic tangle, to the tangle that we started with. And so we know how to undo a rotation. We just do one more rotation in succession, and then we've undone the rotation that we did. But what we don't yet know, and this is going to be a really interesting question, is how do we undo a twist with just a succession of more twists and more rotations? So how do we untwist a twist? The question of the inverse of t is going to get us more deep into the, the, the algebra inside of the tangle group. So how do we untwist a twist? It turns out, and this is the surprise, that we can, in fact, untwist a twist just by doing more twists of the same type, but combining them with some rotations. What does that look like? Well, let's suppose that I just take a tangle and I add a twist onto the end of it like this. Question is, how can I uncross this crossing just by doing more twists and possibly some rotations? Well, the first thing that we might observe is if we start trying to untwist this twist by adding more twists, it feels like we're just making this a more complex tangle rather than trying to make it simpler, which is ultimately the goal, because we need to get back to where we started. So chances are we're probably not going to follow up a twist with another twist at any point in this process, because that's just going to add extra crossings that we would ultimately like to get rid of. So anytime we do a twist in this process, we're probably going to follow it up with a rotation. So let's start with that. We'll just take this tangle and rotate it 90 degrees. Well, now what? if we're trying to get back to our original tangle. If we do a second rotation, we already know that two rotations in succession just gives us an equivalent tangle to the one that we started with. So if I did one more rotation, I'd be taking a step backwards to this. Rather than making my tangle simpler, I would just be undoing the thing that I just did. So chances are also that we're not going to follow up a rotation with another rotation in this process of trying to untwist a twist. So what this argues is that when we're untwisting a twist, what we should be doing is alternating a twist with a rotation, followed by another twist, followed by another rotation, and so forth. The question is, will that process ever get us back to home? Let's find out. Let's follow that rotation with another twist. And oh dear, it looks like this is even more complicated <laughs> than it was originally. Uh, but let's keep the faith. One more rotation. Now my tangle looks like this. Um, so I still have these crossings that I don't quite know what to do with, so let's add one more twist, dutifully, see where that leaves us, and it looks like a mess. Um, in particular, uh, it looks like a mess because we've got our tangle here that was in the middle, this, this box with a G in it that probably has a bunch of crossings in it that we don't know and we can't have an impact on, um, but it looks like it's kind of upside down. So let's do one more rotation, and kind of take a look at this, um, take a look at what we have here. And what we notice is that at this point in the ball game, if I were the person standing at this corner of the tangle and holding this rope connected to this part of the tangle, um, then I would have been holding the northwest corner of this square. And at this point in the process, I have returned back to my original position in the northwest corner, and my rope into the tangle is still connected to this northwest corner. So it feels like if I'm one of the people standing at the vertices of this rectangle and holding the ropes at the ends of this tangle, that I'm back to where I started after this whole process of T's and R's. And the other thing that we notice is if we look at all of the crossings that we've introduced on the outside of this unknown piece of tangle here in the middle, all these crossings look like they're under crossings in a sense. And sure enough, if we apply our Reitemeister moves to reduce the numbers of crossings, we, what we notice is that if the people at all four corners of this rectangle were to pull on their ropes, then the tangle would right itself, again, and be upright. And this yellow strand, which is crossing underneath all of the other strands, a type 2 Reitermeister move could pull it out from underneath everything else so that the person in the southeast corner here would again be holding a short rope connected to the southeast corner of this tangle. And sure enough, we slide that rope out from underneath all the other ropes 
the tangle has righted itself, everybody's back in their original positions, and that means that this combination of T's and R's gives us an identity operation on tangles. And so if we take stock of what this means from an algebra standpoint, it means that the composition TR, TR, TR is equal to the identity. And so we figured out how to undo a twist. We can undo a twist by rotating, twisting, rotating, twisting, and rotating. So this combination of T's and R's is the inverse that we're looking for, for capital T. So we know that we can untwist a twist by just adding this combination of more twists and rotations. And so now we know enough to be able to assert confidently that the operations we can do on rational tangles form what we call a group. And so this group that I call the tangle group um, is the set of all operations that we can do on tangles. And I think of an operation as a function, which takes in one tangle and it spits out another tangle, possibly different, possibly the same, but they differ only by a combination of t's and r's. And if we take the collection of all such functions, under the operation of function composition, what we get is properly called a group in abstract algebra. It satisfies associativity because function composition, uh, in general in set theory, satisfies associativity for function composition. If it doesn't matter whether I do the second and third of these uh, operations first and then F1, or if I do F1 and F2, followed by F3. The grouping by parentheses doesn't make a difference. It also satisfies closure. If I have any two tangle operations and I compose them together, what I get is another tangle operation. Because again, all of these are just built out of arbitrary combinations of T's and R's. We know that there is an identity operation, just do nothing to my tangle, uh, and that itself is also an operation on tangles, so it belongs to this group. Um, and then most crucially, and the one that we just finished making the argument for, every tangle operation can be inverted. For any way to make a tangle more complex by adding more T's and R's to it, we also now know how to undo each of those tangle operations. So there exists an inverse for everything we can do to tangles using t's and r's, and that inverse is also built out of t's and r's. And so all four of these conditions that define what it means in abstract algebra to be a group are satisfied. And so we have a group under composition uh, that describes everything that we can do to rational tangles by adding more twists and adding more rotations. And it's our goal now to understand this group in more depth and figure out if this group and its properties can get us closer to that goal of representing rational tangles by rational numbers. And so what we'll do is we'll write down what group theorists call a presentation for this group. And when we write down a presentation for a group, the presentation has two parts. Uh, the first part, that comes before this vertical bar in the notation, are called the generators. The generators are the building blocks. Uh, that are responsible for building every single element in this group. So for us, the building blocks are our two basic tangle operations, the twist and the rotation. And by definition, every tangle operation that we can do is built out of some combination of t's and r's. Right? So some number of powers of t composed with some number of powers of r, and then possibly again and again and again. So t and r are what we call the generators for this tangle group. But the generators interact with one another. They're not unrelated. And so the second piece of our presentation comes after the vertical bar. They're called the relations on this group. And the relations specify the interdependence between our generators. So we took great pains to argue that um, R, the rotation operation, is uh, related to itself in the sense that it's its own inverse. R squared is equal to the identity. And the really exciting thing that we just discovered at the beginning of this video was that T and R composed together done three times, so TR, 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 that that composition of operations also gives us back the identity. And so those two ways of making the identity out of combinations of T's and R's are what we call rotations. So they're a part of the presentation for this tangle group. What we haven't argued for here, but which is true, uh, is that these are the only two uh, operations, so the only two interrelations between T and R that are necessary to describe the entirety of the tangle group. We won't get into those details here, uh, but there are, there are papers that you can read uh, that do so. And so this describes everything that we need to know about the operations T and R that define the nature of this tangle group. You'll notice also that we didn't list any particular power of T which gives us back the identity. That's because T was a free generator. Right? No matter how many twists that we do in succession, we're always going to get something different uh, unless we start weaving in rotations. And so by its definition, this group, you know, I'm calling gamma, acts upon the set of tangles. So it, each of the elements in this group 
gives us a function that can turn one tangle into another tangle. If we want to understand better how to represent tangles, let's think about other sets on which this group could act. How else could we think about T and R as transforming things, not just tangles, but maybe simpler objects? First question is, can we think about how this group might transform the vertices of a tangle, the points at the vertices of the rectangle, which are the tether points of the tangle? Uh, what I mean by that is when we were arguing for the fact that the TR quantity to the third power gave us the identity, we sort of traced where one of the people holding the ropes in the tangle uh, ended up after doing TR three times. They ended up back in the same position that they started. So maybe that's important to our understanding of how tangles work. So let's look at just how TR, that single composition, changes the positions of the tethers, the people A, B, C, and D, I've labeled them, standing around the vertices. If I do T first, what it's going to do is it's going to twist up these two strands, and B and C, these two people, are going to trade places. If I then also rotate, then everyone in the vertices of this, so this rectangle here are going to take one step to their left, our right, looking from above, and the positions of the people standing around the vertices of the rectangle have changed again. So the combination of T followed by R leads to this person A moving one position, it leads to this person B moving to the opposite side of where they started. D also has moved from the lower left to the upper left. Um, and C actually ends up in the same place that they started this uh, tangled dance. And so if we take stock of that all together, we, what we get is a permutation of the four elements A, B, C, and D. And in that permutation, A moves from the first position to the second position. The B, which was originally in the second position, moves to the fourth position. The D, which was originally in the fourth position, moves to the first position. And so in our permutation group cycle notation, we'll write 1, 2, 4 as our cycle. And then C ends up not moving at all. And so in the permutation group on four symbols, we can represent the operation TR on tangles by the three cycle 1, 2, 4. A from the first position went to the second position. B from the second went to the fourth. D from the fourth went back to the first, one to two to four, back to one, and three hasn't changed. So the observation we can make knowing a little bit about the symmetric group is that this three cycle, one, two, four, is an operation of order three. If I did that three times in the symmetric group, I would get back to the identity. This is what we observed when we were working this out on tangles, that after we do TR combination three times in succession, everybody, A, B, C, and D, ends up back in the same position that they started. It also happened to be true that all the extra crossings that we introduced in the process could untwist themselves with Reitermeister moves to show us that the tangle was also the same. But this gave us sort of the base understanding that in order for the tangles to be the same, we want the same people to be in the same positions, at least, uh, at, the, at the end of the process. So in the symmetric group, this has order three. And it turned out that in the tangle group, TR in combination had order three as well. So that was a good set of evidence. So it feels like this should be a good way to represent tangles, is just look at what happens to the people holding the ropes. So can we expect that it's also going to be true that this represents the tangle group completely, right? Are there ways of moving people around the outsides of the ropes uh, that are different, the, the, in which that permutation behaves differently than the corresponding operations on tangles? It turns out there that the answer is yes. Let's take a look at what happens if I do uh, two twists, so a T followed by a T. If I do two twists to a tangle, I'm going to introduce these two new crossings. But B and C, the two people holding the ropes, are going to end up in the same position after that pair of crossings, northeast and southeast respectively, that they started. So B and C started up here, and after two twists, they also end up in the same place. And so in the permutation group, B and C trading places twice gives us back the identity permutation. The problem is that on the tangle side, we don't have an identity operation after doing two tangles. This combination of two twists is not the same as the original tangle. Right? So two twists in tangle world are not equal to the identity. But two permutations, two transpositions of B and C in the permutation group world are the identity. And so this is a problem. This means that we can't just look at what happens around the vertices of the tangle. We can't just look at the people holding the ropes to determine what's happening with the crossings more generally, what's happening with the tangle more generally. So using permutations to represent 
uh, the Tangle group, is an imperfect representation. It's what we call not a faithful representation. Even though it captures this behavior, the, the TR to the third power equals the identity behavior, it doesn't adequately capture the R squared equals the identity behavior that we see happening in the Tangle group. So what we want is to represent tangles and operations on tangles in a different way, which can capture all of that interesting abstract algebra. So how do we do that is the question we tackle next.